Uh, great, so I'm happy to introduce the last panel of our conference with these uh, wonderful people that we have on stage. And I'm also very excited because we have really great conversation already by email and a lot of uh, sharing. Um, so perhaps I also even feel that my role as moderator, I could just go away because I'm sure they can do by themselves interacting. <laughs> but uh, I'm here, so I'm happy to, you know, uh, bring a bit of reflection to start. So, the panel has the title on the politics of AI, fighting injustice and automatic supremacism. And so I'm happy to have here on stage Dia Kayali, Oskis, and uh, Dan McKillen. And so, um, so uh, I think that as a starting point of reflection, uh, we could, uh, you know, point out uh, uh, the assumption that uh, AI is political. And so then I think this panel is going to unfold that. What does it mean? I think that today we have been already touching a lot uh, upon this point, uh, but uh, in this panel we want to enter into the focus uh, of uh, how AI is political, why, and also what can we do uh, to, in a sense, uh, be aware of this politics and also find uh, possible countermeasures. And uh, I think an, import an important point that we have been having in these days was really the fact that uh, as a technology also AI is not neutral. Uh, and it's not neutral because uh, it's done by people, then is implemented by machine and then affect people again. So there is the human level that is really important to consider and uh, also the effect uh, of technology on this human level. So today we are going to unfold this matter and try to understand uh, from one side uh, what could be a situated perspective on this subject. So how we can interpret uh, the idea of AI dealing with important issues uh, uh, like gender, sexuality, uh, but at the same time also uh, opening up to the discourse of uh, uh, you know, race, as we have been doing with uh, Mutaleb before, uh, or even adopting a larger sociological perspective in terms also of how and uh, in which way society is structured. So I think that we are really facing, uh, in a sense, a coexistence of position because uh, we are speaking about the idea of um, uh, situating a technology on the practice uh, and uh, you know, the perspective of people, but at the same time we are speaking about uh, a technology of abstraction. And so this was also part of our internal conversation. So I'm really happy to see uh, what uh, our great panelists uh, have to say and also have a conversation with all the public. Uh, so um, I think that, uh, you know, questions that we could bring is uh, what do we need to take into consideration when calling for a just AI? And also how is AI facilitating white supremacy, nationalism, racism and transphobia? And how, we can, how can we develop an anti-fascist AI? So these are questions that I'm posing and I think also we want to answer and uh, collectivize and discuss with all of you. And so we start with Dia Kayali. Uh, they coordinate witness uh, tech and advocacy work, uh, working on tools and policy that uh, help human rights advocates document human rights abuses and expose them to the world. They have been engaged in activism and the fight for human rights since high school. Um, when they got uh, tear gas in the 1999, uh, 1999 the World Trade Organization protest that we all remember pretty well, unfortunately. Um, and uh, uh, their interest in surveillance developed uh, as a Syrian American in post 9 11 USA. And before joining Witness, uh, Dia worked as a fellow with coding rights uh, in the context of the two. Uh, 2016 Olympics in Brazil. So I leave the word to you and then I will introduce one after the other. Great, can everyone, yes, I'm, yeah, I can hear myself very okay. Um, so I'm gonna start with a disclaimer, which is that I, I literally just flew back to Berlin from a conference in Tunisia called RightsCon and um, 
I did a little bit of on-the-fly editing, actually, of my slideshow to include some things from there, um, and also to respond a little bit to the last talk, which was incredible. Thank you. Um, and, and you said some of the things that I'm going to sort of elaborate on, so uh, it was a beautiful transition into this. Um, so I guess with that, and so I'm, I'm a little, I may be a little bit loopy. Uh, I, I took the red eye, um, so we'll see how this goes. Uh, so with that, I'm just going to go ahead and jump right in. Um, oh, hopefully with the proper slideshow. Come on. Okay, there we go. So um, actually, first I want to ask, does anybody recognize who this is? Nobody, oh my gosh, okay. Uh, this is Weave. <laughs> um, he's a, a really, really horrible white supremacist hacker who also got supported by the community as sort of a symbol of, um, of their concern around overbroad hacking laws. Um, he's also exactly the kind of person that I think would say something like this. Um, I put this up here. Actually, I have another preliminary question for the audience. Um, because content moderation was, was discussed in the last panel a little bit. How many people here are familiar with the term content moderation? Just Okay, great. Almost everyone. I am going to be talking about it um, quite a bit, and I'm going to be talking about how it connects to the real world. Um, I actually don't find this sort of distinction of offline and online particularly helpful or meaningful anymore, um, and some of the examples I'm going to talk about explain why. Um, but I just wanted to start off with, with this point that uh, sometimes when we start trying to push the boundaries of emerging technologies, um, especially when we're coming from a sort of technological or academic background, we can forget what is actually happening in the world and how people are experiencing those technologies. Um, and this ability to say, uh, let me, I'm trying to find my notes here, sorry. Well, I'm gonna try to go without my notes. So this ability to say, um, just get off of Facebook, um, you know, if you don't like the way that content moderation algorithms are working on Facebook, um, if you don't like the way that your data is being gathered and used for multiple purposes that have nothing to do with Facebook, um, in potentially getting government benefits or, you know, being targeted advertising, it's really easy to say, well, uh, just, just get off of that platform. Um, but when we're talking about emerging technologies, and in particular AI, um, I'm just remaking a point that's clearly already been made. Uh, the people who are going to be most affected and can least afford to get away from those technologies are the people that are going to be harmed the most by them. Um, so I just wanted to start with that as the premise of some of what I'm going to talk about. And I just had to use Weave because he's such an asshole. OK. Um, so not everyone here raised their hand for content moderation, so I'm just going to give a really, really brief explanation of what it is. Um, I'm mainly talking about commercial content moderation. So this is the process whereby um, platforms, social media platforms, but also other types of uh, technology platforms decide what can be on their platforms. Um, it's usually outsourced to people who get paid very little. Uh, someone mentioned the movie The Cleaners. I really recommend that everyone watch that film if you want to hear a little bit about what it's like to look at content all day long, um, hate speech, beheadings, um, this kind of thing. So um, the, the page that I have up here is Rohingya Vision. Um, actually, let me see another show of hands. How many people here have heard of the Aran Arakan Valley attacks? Yeah, OK. Actually, not that many. Um, so Rohingya Vision is a, a non-traditional media outlet that is one of the only sources that the Rohingya people have to get reliable news on what's happening in their community, both inside Myanmar and in Bangladesh. Um, for those who are not familiar with the situation, uh, the Rohingya are a group in Myanmar that has been subject to ethnic cleansing. Um, many of them have been pushed over the border into Bangladesh. And uh, they have been subject to a very broad targeted attack, particularly on social media, by the Myanmar government. Um, and, and when you talk about Facebook in Myanmar, um, I promise I'm going to connect this to, to um, artificial intelligence. But when you talk about Facebook in Myanmar, um, for many people, Facebook is the internet. If they want to get news, they're not going to go to news.google.com or cnn.com. Um, they're going to go to Facebook and they're going to type in their search terms. So this has been an incredibly important resource um, for the community. Uh, they were the, the um, 
the reason I asked about the Arakan attack is because this was a huge surge of violence against this community. And when it started happening, there were people using Facebook as a tool to warn others in the community. Um, you know, there's military headed your way. This is what just happened in this last village. Here's what you can expect. Um, oh, great. Okay, good. Um, and, uh, sorry, one moment. Great. So, um, the reason I bring this up is because this page was taken down by Facebook in the middle of this, uh, in the middle of this surge of violence. Um, sorry about this. Um, so, so this page was taken down in the middle of a surge of, of violence. And fast forward to today, people from Myanmar have been working with Facebook for the last few years to talk about how the um, algorithmic content moderation that is being applied there has been really promoting hate speech that results in real world violence very rapidly. Um, this is the kind of speech that gets uh, promoted to people. It's also the kind of speech that the content moderation algorithms don't always flag, and they really can't understand. And in particular, because of the cultural context, um, because of the sort of code words that people use, but also because um, like algorithms created by Facebook to try to moderate content, they really can't even understand um, different scripts, for example. Um, and, and so, uh, we're seeing this kind of content get taken down. And, and, it, and this really is, for many people, the only place where they can get this information. Um, so another, another sort of baseline thing that I, I just wanted to mention, um, and I apologize because I haven't been here for the whole time, has anyone mentioned China's social uh, credit system yet? No? no. Okay. Um, I love asking uh, the audience to raise hands because it's how I know that you're listening. So how many people here are familiar with that? China's um, social credit rating system. Okay, a lot of people, um, but again, I'll just very briefly say for those who are not familiar with it, um, this is a, a system that is engaging all of China's surveillance capabilities to basically give people a social credit rating, which can then affect a lot of things. For example, their ability to travel, um, their ability to get jobs, um, and it's, uh, it's using predictive algorithms, and it's something that a lot of times in the sort of human rights space, which is where I'm usually working, people will point to that um, as sort of, it's something that's happening over there, uh, you know, look at how bad China is, um, that might have something to do with how much of the funding in the space is really coming from the US and really focused on enemies of the US. Um, and I think it's really easy to other this kind of thing, and I just wanna, wanna say it's really not, um, that's really not accurate, right? Um, we've already heard, uh, even in the small amount of talks that I heard, I heard people talking about how machine learning algorithms are being used already to make decisions in Europe. Um, and I am not gonna list the ways that they're used because I can't see my notes, and, but I would encourage everyone to check out this study. Um, it was just released, and it looks at different ways that these types of algorithms are being used to make decisions in Europe about um, uh, social welfare benefits, um, housing placement, um, really everyday details of people's lives. Um, so, you know, just for the reality check, we're already there. And when I say we, I'm not just talking about so-called, um, you know, far away oppressive regimes, I'm talking about right here. Am I speaking too quickly? Okay, I'm gonna slow down. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit sorry that I threw this slide in here, but not really, um, because uh, I just wanna make sure that this discussion, again, is gr grounded in reality, and it's grounded in people's experience of, these, of machine learning algorithms. Um, so for those who are not familiar, um, and, and as Maya pointed out earlier so, so well, um, there's a lot of really great race theory coming from the US, and this is the foundation of a lot of it. And actually, when I hear people talk about, inter the little, uh, little tangent here, when I hear people talk about intersectionality um, in Berlin, I, I think sometimes they've, they've never actually read any 
Kimberly Crenshaw and are not familiar with what the term means, and so that's why I'm bringing it up here. So intersectionality is a theory that looks at the ways that uh, structures of privilege and power intersect and interlocked um, to not just create a one plus one experience of those structures, but actually to substantively change them. And so what I mean by that, um, the, the example comes from um, Kimberly Crenshaw, and I'll give the example that, that uh, is very commonly used um, when we're talking about, uh, so black women, um, and their experience uh, in the workplace of hairstyles. So women have uh, all sorts of experiences in the workplace of structural privilege and power, um, even in terms of dress codes, in terms of expected behavior. Um, that's one piece of it. Um, black folks have another experience of structure, structural privilege and power in the workplace that can disadvantage them. So you might think that if someone were to be black and a woman, that it might be they're experiencing both of those things. But actually there's specific forms of discrimination that only affect that uh, intersectionally affected community. And a really good example is hairstyles. So there is a um, pretty well-known case in the US where um, black women who were flight attendants were suing because there were specific hairstyles that were prohibited um, that really only affected them. So, um, dreadlocks and braids, by the way, things that um, people in, uh, uh, in Berlin really enjoy sporting. Um, you know, it's great if, if you can do that and, and you might not lose your job, but that was not the experience of this women. And they were trying to structure US case law to acknowledge that when you're talking about so-called suspect classes, you have to look at the ways that these classes intersect. So it's a substantively different thing. And this is really important when we're talking about the application of AI in our lives. Um, so here I put this refugee plus queer plus activist. Um, this is an example that works in Berlin. Um, if we're talking about AI, we can think about uh, provision of healthcare. We can think about um, access to citizenship, movement, visas, all of these things um, for a person in Berlin who is a refugee and queer and an activist is gonna be different than just adding those things up, one plus one plus one. They're gonna have different specific experiences, things that they have to be concerned about and ways that um, they are affected by this technology. Um, okay, so I'm gonna uh, start actually with an example of the first time that I in my career um, started hearing people talk about how machine learning algorithms could really solve a, a, a problem. Um, so uh, this is a photo from a protest that was held in front of Facebook headquarters in 2014. And this, um, this protest was because there was a huge wave of drag queens that started getting kicked off Facebook for violations of Facebook's real name policy. Has anybody heard of this? Anybody know someone who's been kicked off of Facebook because of the name policy? Um, <laughs> um, so uh, those who raised your hand, maybe you know more queer people because so many trans people get affected by this. Um, and so it appeared that people were specifically targeting drag queens and reporting them for a violation of the name policy. And, um, and really it would be like everyone in a single group, but it was not just drag queens. Um, it was transgender people, in particular transgender teenagers who were not using the name on Facebook that um, they would use in daily life and certainly not the name that their parents knew them by or the name that is on their IDs. Um, but uh, also like, furries, leather communities, uh, burlesque performers, sex workers, and it really appeared like people were going to Facebook groups and reporting people en masse, um, and actually organizing to report people. Um, and there, there are examples of Facebook groups where people organize to report people in other Facebook groups. So why am I bringing all of this up? Because um, it's really a bad idea, especially if your headquarters are right next to San Francisco, to piss off a bunch of drag queens. Um, that this was just a really poorly calculated decision on Facebook's part. Um, they pissed off. Uh, so the queen in the middle with the, with the purple feathery, that's, that's Sister Roma. She's a sister of perpetual indulgence and an activist. And um, she was one of the first people who sort of got, uh, uh, lost her account in this shutdown. And her account was changed to her legal name. No one knows Sister Roma's legal name. It's, it's very, it was very weird for all of us. Um, and it really actually affected her career. Uh, and it, potentially put her in danger because of her association with work. 
Um, so uh, after a protest in front of headquarters and a lot of bad press, um, about a month later, Facebook said that they were gonna change the policy. Um, so this is what the policy is now. Um, use the same name that you use in everyday life. Um, they, they said that it, the policy was never use your legal name, but that's simply inaccurate. I have screenshots of when the policy said that and when the policy asked you to send in your driver's license, and that was the only option in order to verify your identity. Um, so Facebook came back and they said, well, we're gonna change the wording um, from real name because we've heard from the trans, the trans community that um, it's actually about authentic identities. It was about a lot more than that. Um, actually, one other group that I didn't mention was domestic violence survivors who were reg are and still are regularly exposed by this policy, um, also teachers. Uh, but, um, but they were really wanted to cater to the trans community so, uh, because of the bad press. So they came back about a month later and said, we've changed the policy. Um, now it doesn't say real name. Now it says authentic name. And here's all these other kinds of ID that you can use just send us your ID, no big deal, to verify your identity, and you can trust us with that information. Um, the other solution that they proposed after many, many months of um, embarrassing protests and um, pride protests and town halls where angry drag queens yelled at them was that um, they were gonna start using machine learning algorithms to detect when accounts were fake or not. Um, so instead of only uh, listening to flagging, because just flagging something doesn't mean it's going to get in front of a, a content moderator right away. Um, so they were gonna use these, uh, these algorithms to feed into the analysis of whether an account was real or not. Um, so, <laughs> I'll save the horror for a second. Um, so as you can guess, this really uh, didn't appear to make a difference to people. Um, really the biggest change that we achieved in several years of activism, and, and actually I should, I should um, rewind for a second and say um, that this activism started in the US and then it actually did become global and another group that is extremely affected by this policy is feminists all over the world um, who are vocal and doing activism, and in particular, um, feminists in India and Dalit women, um, they, were, they would be getting these notices in English um, or in really poorly translated uh, local languages, and they wouldn't know what the notices were saying. They would send in their ID, and then their account would get um, reactivated with a name that indicates what their cast is attached. Um, so uh, just one example of, of also globally where it was a problem. Um, and by the way, when Facebook came back to say they were, they were gonna use machine learning, they didn't mention that community. They really just wanted to talk to drag queens because that's, that's how they kind of try to cover their asses. Um, but all this being said, uh, the bottom line is that Facebook believes that it can understand and know enough about how trans people and drag queens and trans youth and other people who might not want to use their legal name on Facebook they think they can understand enough about that to build a, a, a set of training data and write an algorithm that is going to help them know who should be allowed into what is the public square for many of us these days. Um, and, and I still get, we have this email um, that we still get emails, the, the people I was organizing with around this, um, saying, please, please, I, I lost my account. Um, you know, I, I lost all my contacts. Like, this is how I promote my, myself. This is how I, um, I think for me, the, the, the one that is the most frustrating is trans youth who are on Facebook really using it as like a sexual health uh, information center, um, using it for their mental health. Uh, and, you know, this, this operation of this algorithm in deciding whether or not their name is authentic enough to allow them to be on the platform is invisible to them. Um, what they see is the end result, which is I was just kicked off and maybe they lost access because um, more and more, you know, people are just using Facebook Messenger and not even getting phone numbers, right? Um, so uh, it's really actually a form of online violence towards this community um, and it's being facilitated by algorithms that are built in Silicon Valley mostly by cis white men. Like this guy. <laughs> Um, I, I had actually a few images um, of like the very cheesy uh, what people used to think of as AI and robots and then I just realized I don't need that. I can just, yeah. 
Um, and I'm, I'm sad that I can't see my notes because I know I'm missing points, but I will come back to them in the Q&A. So don't worry. Um, you'll, you'll hear what I have to say. Um, so uh, I know predictive policing has been mentioned a little bit already. Uh, I just, and actually I really appreciate that um, someone in the audience asked, you know, well, aren't algorithms just going to spit out the same thing every time? Um, well, first of all, with machine learning algorithms, once you've, uh, once you've given it its initial set of training data and, and set it out there, um, you know, machine learning algorithms, I like to think of them as kids or puppies. Um, you know, you give them some information and then you just let them go out there, but they're always going to have what they were initially given, right? And so um, white people are going to be white and um, algorithms written by, written by white people are also going to be white. Um, <laughs> or any other number of biases that might be written in. Um, and increasingly, because of the complexity and because of trade secrets, I mean, we have no way to know what that means. Um, so I'm going to actually... Uh, speed through some of these so I can get to uh, uh, extremist content algorithms. Speed through, Mark. Uh, okay. Um, so this is just garbage in, garbage out. Like predictive policing is very good at predicting policing. And what I mean by that is you feed in a bunch of data about crime statistics of, um, and what kind of ki crime stati statistics are you going to have? Um, car break-ins, muggings, um, really petty crimes, sex work, right? Um, you're not going to have uh, these predictive policing algorithms. Has anyone heard of a predictive policing algorithm that is looking at white collar crime and figuring out how to predict who you should and should not hire? <laughs> There's a piece of art. Yeah, it would be a piece of art if that actually managed to come out of Silicon Valley, but it's not going to. Um, so garbage in, garbage out. And uh, so I want to talk a little bit about terrorism and white supremacy. Um, so uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, a little bit of research that I did at the Berliner Gazette conference back in November where um, I sat down, this is totally qualitative, not quantitative, but I sat down with someone and we went down the YouTube rabbit hole. And um, I was trying to, I think I started with some search terms about um, uh, federal charges against um, Proud Boys that traveled over state lines to go to Charlottesville, right? Um, I immediately, within clicking on one video, was taken to propaganda videos. And when I say propaganda videos, um, th these are the kind of videos I'm talking about. The third one is a really good example. Um, the Rise Above Movement is another one of these neo-Nazi groups in the US. Um, and they really love to post a lot of videos, also the Proud Boys, they love to post these videos of themselves working out, um, getting buff, and talking about how they're gonna protect the white race. Um, and these videos are still all over YouTube. Um, these, this is actually a current shot. Um, at the same time as I was doing this at uh, Berliner Gazette, I was also working on a project to um, report content on Facebook, and I was reporting tons of Proud Boys content. None of it got taken down until Facebook got in trouble in the media and took down all Proud Boys content. So um, anyway, the point is, this is where you go very, very quickly. Um, and you know, it makes sense because these are sensational. Um, they're, uh, they're gonna get lots of advertising dollars. Um, when we are, when we hear talk about, you know, uh, advertisers being more selective, they're not being selective towards this kind of content. Um, so, uh, so Proud Boys videos are still up there. They're, they're on Facebook. They're not being captured by, um, on, on Facebook and on YouTube. And they are not being captured by the institution of extremist content machine learning algorithms that are doing content moderation. So what is being captured? Um, so what I'm referring to is two years ago, I'm gonna try to say this very quickly. Two years ago, um, YouTube started applying machine learning algorithms to their videos to try to detect extremist content. Um, and when they say extremist content and when they say terrorism, what they mean is um, Arabs and Muslims. And they mean content especially from Syria. And as far as I can tell, I think all of their training data comes from Syria and maybe Yemen. Um, but, uh, but that's what they mean by extremist content. And that's what they're trying to detect with those algorithms. Um, we can go in the Q&A into why that is and what, where they get their definitions of extremism and also how Europe is furthering this with current legislation. Um, I don't think we have time for that now. Um, but this is, uh, Sham English News is one of the many pages that has gotten taken down over and over and over again. 
Um, this is a source that has been referred to by the UN. It's been referred to by major news outlets. Um, it is a huge source of videos for the Syrian Archive, an amazing project everyone should check out, which has um, pulled a bunch of videos from the Sham News Network and put them into databases of verified content from Syria. Um, and, I, and I have to say, uh, as someone who is half Syrian, um, for me, you know, and, and for all of us, this content um, that is online, it has, the entire conflict has been documented. Um, and the crimes that have been committed by the regime have been documented, the crimes that have been committed by other parties have been documented, by people, many people who have risked their lives and are right now risking their lives to do this. Um, and, and people really feel very strongly about maintaining this content to the point where people talk about how they want to pass down their video archives to their children because this is the only history that we're going to have of what's happened. Especially now that people are talking about, um, you know, the reconstruction process. For many of us, we're like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, who are you reconstructing for and who's exactly going back? Um, so it's really a, a collective memory for many people and it is just being um, decimated by this extremist content algorithm. And um, those of us in civil society who are concerned about it have no access to the training data. Um, even if we sign an NDA, we can't see the training data. Um, we have no access to the engineers. Um, we, we really can have no influence on how this is playing out. And this is not just about this type of content. We are going to see this applied to every type of objectionable content. And I'm sorry, like being in Germany, um, this is going to be a great test case for how the rest of the world is going to do this. Um, and in fact, it already is because other countries are copying laws from here and using them in a very authoritarian way. Um, so, so one other thing, on, on this is a slide that I added, and um, I'm almost done. Um, I had to add this because I was just at RightsCon, and this study was released on Wednesday by a group called Equality Labs. Um, they did a year-long project where they reported content on Facebook. They reported hate speech. Um, I almost put an example on here, and then I realized there's not enough trigger warnings for what, uh, what you would have seen, but the one of the examples I was gonna put up was a staged video that was purported to be um, Dalits that were committing violence against Hindus, completely staged video, um, it, and it was a well-known fake, um, and it remains on Facebook now, after being reported by um, people who spent, volunteers actually, who spent hours of their lives sitting on these groups looking at this disgusting content. Um, so 93% of what they reported to Facebook remains on Facebook. And when we talk to Facebook about hate speech uh, and about how they're making these decisions, again, uh, the thing that they keep saying is, well, you know, um, you just can't solve it with people. The, we, we don't have enough resources. Um, it's not scalable to have enough content moderators. And I, I would like to point out, by the way, Germany, you have far more than your fair share of content moderators because of NetsDG. You have, you have an office of content moderators here in Berlin that just focuses on Germany. When you report content in Germany, I'm a little bit pissed if you can't tell. When you report content in Germany, it gets response almost immediately. And great for you, but there are women in India who have their names and pictures posted on Facebook saying, oh, look at this Muslim lover, like Hindu women, you know, look at this, mu this Muslim lover, um, this is her address. These, these things either don't get taken down, um, and, and uh, the vast majority of it, by the way, is anti-Muslim, um, whether it's Muslims um, inside of India or whether it's the Rohingya. Um, so this content is just staying up there, and I'm sorry, but all the machine learning algorithms in the world cannot understand the cultural context. Again, when you can't even get the terms of service in understandable local dialects, um, it's really embarrassing. Some of the translations of the Facebook community standards literally say the opposite of what they're supposed to say. So instead of saying this content is prohibited, it says this content is not prohibited. Um, so, uh, you know, that's the, that's the sort of disparity that we're working with and uh, uh, the people who are creating these algorithms, not only um, is it mainly people from Silicon Valley, even the, the staff that are in India um, are potentially uh, working directly with the Modi government and working with like the Hindu nationalist government now. Um, so, uh, wonderful, this is the segue. Um, by the way, I, I love that you said cash is king um, because that's, that's where I'm ending. 
you know, the, this is the bottom line. The bottom line is um, where is the investment and who's making the decisions and why is it that this content is staying up um, and uh, influencing people. And I'm, and, and I'm not saying like things get taken down and should get taken down. I'm saying why do some things get taken down and not others? Um, and how do we address that? Again, keeping in mind sort of all the political realities I brought up of who is most likely to be subject to these kinds of algorithms, who has the privilege to get away from them, um, and, and how can we include all of those communities in any sort of vision for a future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dia. Um, I'm also happy you mentioned the Berliner Gazette conference because it's where we met. So it's also nice to have this, uh, you know, experience of networking and sharing among each other. Um, so now we go on with the next presentation that I think in a sense would also answer to some of your questions. And we were trying to do this nice transition. Um, and uh, also we then want to open to the public for some questions that you pose already. Uh, so I'm happy to introduce Oz Keys, that is a PhD student at the University of Washington, where they study gender, data, and infrastructure of control, and uh, they are also an Ada Lovelace Fellow. Uh, they work, uh, their work uh, spans on science and technology studies, gender studies, and human-computer interaction. And so they are working on the issues of facial recognition system, um, and also how they are shaping the human identity. So I'm very happy to welcome you here and uh, also to hear your presentation. Thank you. Okay, um, yes, so, so that sort of covers like most of me, yeah. Um, I am the other kind of facial, uh, facial recognition researcher. Um, I, I study how to burn the systems down rather than how to make them better. I don't believe that better facial recognition is possible. Um, and I'm, I'm here, I guess, to talk about a particular case study in facial recognition, um, which is a, a subfield called automated gender recognition. Um, I'm afraid that uh, much like Mutale, I did not bring any case studies to scientifically prove that apartheid was bad. I was not aware this was a requirement or a thing that had not already been done countless times over, but um, no problem. Uh, so automated gender recognition is a subfield of facial recognition that looks for uh, ways to classify someone's gender by investigating uh, and analyzing photos of them or videos of them or so on and so forth. Um, and the people who make this, which is a lot of people, um, it's big companies like Microsoft and IBM, uh, it's small startups, it's the US government, it's pretty much every university, um, point to a range of uh, ways in which it could be used. So for example, uh, they point to uh, access control to gendered spaces. Um, this is a specific example brought up. They point to bathrooms and uh, changing rooms. Um, they point to uh, advertising. Uh, if you have gender recognition, then um, you can, actual line from an actual work on this subject, um, integrate a camera into a billboard and have it display cars for men and pretty dresses for females. Which actually, in a weird way, made me very happy because I was reading this paper and I was going, if those fuckers can get tenure. <laughs> and then the other big use is um, sort of uh, marketing and also what they usually refer to as uh, purely computational uses, which is this extremely weird way of phrasing, um, if you can infer someone's gender through facial recognition and you have a like general facial recognition algorithm for surveillance, then immediately you cut in half the number of pictures that you're trying to match this face to. Clever, right? Um, and we've actually seen it deployed in a lot of places, including in fact in Berlin. Um, for uh, International Women's Day, uh, uh, a couple of months ago. Um, I've got to be honest, ever since I moved to New York, uh, my sense of time has not functioned. Um, 
the the ticket machines for the trains uh, had for like that day, they had ticket machines that uh, gave a discounted fare to women and the way that they detected women was by looking at a like live stream of the customer's face and trying to detect whether they looked womanly enough to be a woman according to the computer. Um, and all of these systems are based around uh, what I like to call the folk model of gender. Um, unfortunately, in this case, the folk model just means it is like the conventional, like colloquial model of gender, uh, not that it is based around like, you know, acoustic guitars and songs about pickup trucks and gun racks and your dog and your ex-wife who left you for your pickup truck slash gun rack. Um, I'm kidding, that's country and western. Uh, folk singers write about how like their wife left them for like the concept of a waterfall. Anyway, so this is the folk model of gender and it basically says that gender has three essential attributes. Uh, the first is it's binary. You can be in one of two gendered categories. Uh, the second is that it is immutable. Um, once you are in a gendered category, that's it. Congrats, here is your gender. Do not pass go, do not collect $200. Um, and uh, that it is uh, physiological, that uh, gender can be inferred through looking at physiological cues. And uh, so at birth, you look at uh, genitals. And um, as an adult, if you look at genitals, you will be arrested, and for good reason. But you tend to use like secondary sexual characteristics or facial structure or hair length or, you know, a mixture of like physiological cues that say something about gender. Um, the problem is that none of these cues say anything about gender, um, and an actual model of gender is uh, slightly more complex. Um, because gender varies between contexts, uh, there are cultures where there are multiple genders, where there are only two genders, but the cues for um, how people are expected to behave because of their gender is completely different, or the same, but much more strict, or much more loose. Um, because gender is constantly being reshaped all the time and like new ways of being are being added or taken away or, or mixed in um, or the same ways of being are having the words we use to describe them like changed. Um, all of which is to say that uh, this folk model of gender amongst many other things does not recognize that trans people exist and uh, I have kind of a vested interest in there being systems that recognize that trans people exist. Um, and, and one fairly obvious reason for this is that um, trans lives are very much categorized by uh, widespread social oppression and societal discrimination uh, in places like healthcare or housing or immigration. Um, if anyone has a spare half hour after we're done, um, please ask me how changing my name is going as an immigrant to the US. Um, and you know, this goes sort of doubly and triply and quadruply for people who face additional like axes of oppression. Um, and it is largely caused when you get down to it by these like very traditional, very rigid like gender norms that are baked into most of Western society. Um, and so when we look at automated gender recognition and when we investigate it, because I did a paper that just did, did just that, uh, I had to read 158 gender recognition papers I genuinely believe that I should get hazard pay or some kind of, like just, not only should they give me the best paper award, they should also give me like a therapist at that conference. But I investigated 158 papers and all of them used like very traditional, very rigid um, gender roles. Um, very, like every single one was like it's a binary, like you can infer it from bone structure. There was a lot of stuff which looked like 19th century phrenology. There was a lot of stuff that sounded like 19th century phrenology. There were a couple of papers that I'm pretty sure were just 19th century phrenology that someone had like, you know, cleaned up the font on. Um, and, and so when you take those extremely traditional gender roles and you bake them into a piece of infrastructure that's used for access control and advertising and marketing, um, you get a load of really obvious consequences, right? Um, on the access control front, uh, if you have software that is designed to be stuck in front of a like bathroom, 
and only let people of the correct gender use the bathroom, and it is built around this traditional like idea of gender, then you get two obvious consequences. Uh, the first is that people are going to only build binarily gendered bathrooms uh, because why would you decide to develop a technology and use a technology and license a technology and then be like, wait, we can't actually put the technology in place. Oh well, I guess we'll send it back and hope that if we not ask nicely, they'll give us our money back. Um, and the second and more obvious is that uh, people who are not gender conforming, people who do not fit those traditional like ideas of gender, um, whether they are trans people, whether they are just women with short haircuts, um, whether they are just like women with facial hair, um, will end up like systemically blocked from using these facilities. And that is fairly obviously discriminatory. There is a reason that so many United States states have tried to legislate this state of affairs into existence. Um, and it is also the sort of thing where it opens up even greater risks. Um, a lot of the papers, for example, say, um, in the case that, you know, that someone is like flagged, like, you know, security or an operator will be alerted. Um, now we know these systems, as Matale was pointing to, do not work well for like people of color and women of color in particular. Uh, we also know exactly what happens when trans women of color are brought into encounter with the police. Um, the answer is not pretty. And so essentially these systems are at their root if deployed for the purposes that they were designed for. Um, the sort of thing that kills people. Uh, and there is no way that they can be fixed through like more diverse data, whatever on earth that means. Um, the fundamental basis of the technology is broken. But the reason I'm bringing this up is not because of uh, those concerns around sort of access control or sort of like murder, although murder is obviously of concern. Um, the reason I'm bringing it up is, is the other aspect, right? The mere fact that it is out there and it is deployed and it becomes more, more prevalent. Um, because the thing about gender is, like I said, it's constantly being reshaped um, and it is constantly varied. Uh, gender is different in different contexts. Uh, gender is shaped by those contexts and by sort of like the social standards that people follow within them, right? Like people have very different ideas of gender in India versus in the UK versus in Seattle versus in 1950s Seattle versus, um, and as a consequence, it's also reshaped by technology. Like te the technology, eh, technological systems we deploy change our ideas of what is possible and they change sort of the background structure of society and people have a tendency to take their cues off technology, right? Of whether they're valid or not, or, or what things it is possible for one to be or not. Um, of when a system like denies that you're legitimate in some way or says that you are legitimate and you're trying to work out why, you come up with a folk theory for like, you know, what the world expects from me, what the world wants from me. Um, and so when we have these big technological systems which have a very fixed idea of gender, I mean, literally, you compile it and then what are you gonna do? Like, disassemble the camera? Answer, yes. If you see one of these systems deployed, please disassemble the camera. That was a joke. Please do not get me in trouble for telling you to like damage private property. We are on streaming, I think. But, hypothetic <laughs> but hypothetically, if someone were to see one of these systems deployed and smash it, I would not morally have any like problem with them <laughs> whatsoever. Speaking, you know, purely morally. Um, but seriously, like what happens if these systems are out there and are deployed and are like fixed and built in? And the, what happens when the ads that you see are like very heavily coded to like how you are presenting, whether or not you meet some idea of like, you know, 19, a 1950s like set of gender norms that never existed, where there were men and there were women, and all of the women were heterosexual and had long hair, and all of the men were like, you know, butch and called Chuck and like, you know, played football. I don't, I, I've got to be honest, I've only been in the US for five years, like I don't have a great basis of reference here. The point is that 
technology is one way that social norms change, and so technology can also be a way that social norms are fixed in place. And so when I see stuff like this discussed and deployed, I don't just see like something that's going to uh, cause murder directly. I also see something that perpetuates those traditional gender roles that make discrimination a thing that people see as okay, that make people treat trans existences as somehow violating like the natural law of the universe. And similarly, if we're gonna talk about how it varies between contexts, um, we have to talk about uh, infrastructural imperialism, um, which is, oh, did the mic go funny? Yeah. Um, which is this notion uh, of basically the way that infrastructures of technology and standards and everything else um, get exported between different contexts and often get exported sort of from the like, quote unquote, developed world to everywhere else. Um, and bring along certain cultural conventions and standards with them. Um, so, for example, uh, if we take gender recognition and if you have a system that is based on, say, facial hair norms or clothing norms, and you take it to a different country in a different part of the world, then one of the consequences is going to be a very different, like, set of norms that this system is going to be run up against versus the norms it was trained on. And in neither space is it anything but vile. But one consequence of it running into those very different norms is that it begins to shape those as well. And when these systems are very frequently sort of things that tech companies in the US, in San Francisco, with 15 guys called Kevin with polo shirts, <laughs> developed on MacBook Airs and decided, well, it works for me, so it must be good. And then like throughout into the world, um, it's not like a two-way street, it's not like a mutual shaping, it's a imposition. Um, and so all of these things I'm servicing, like, you know, this, this imposition of, um, you know, cultural standards, uh, this fixed in placedness, this like powerlessness, really, and the violence that comes along with it, um, are not really things about AI. Like, AI is the weapon, it's not the hand wielding it. The fact of the matter is that we live, at least in the US, and I'd argue pretty much everywhere else as well, although it is like colored by, you know, nations like places in the history of colonialism, um, in, in what Bell Hooks refers to as a uh, white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. Um, and you can see each of these components appear in the structure of gender recognition, right? Um, whiteness appears in which gender norms are taken to be gender norms, right? Like when there are a ton of papers saying that like men are the ones with short hair as if braids and dreadlocks don't exist. When there are a ton of papers saying that men are the ones with like facial hair as if like facial hair doesn't differ like between different ethnicities. Like if, if women don't have like facial hair ever, um, my mother with her extremely Ashkenazi like hair distribution patterns would very much like to have a conversation with these developers and perhaps a broken bottle. Um, you see, uh, you know, um, sorry, m the font is very small and I forgot my glasses. Um, you see colonialism um, appear in a similar way and also in the notion of like how this technology is distributed and imposed um, and how everywhere is assumed to work just like the highly white university departments that are developing this technology. Um, you see, uh, you know, um, capitalism and like the patriarchy appear in the ways that, um, you know, so many of these use cases are about making money, right? Uh, advertising and marketing analytics so that we can better sell uh, more precisely. Uh, the idea of like, you know, women wear lipstick, all women wear lipstick, and only women wear lipstick. Um, the fact that, and this is my personal favorite, um, when the US government tested this technology, they did internal tests, I have all their emails, and I keep publishing news articles about it, which I've heard makes them extremely mad, so I did the responsible thing, which was of course to send in a Freedom of Information Act for all of the emails from their marketing department referring to my articles, to make them sort of recursively mad. Um, because all good civil servants should be poked occasionally with a stick. But when they um, did these internal tests, I've got these, these emails, these fantastic emails, um, which demonstrate just how deep-seated, like, 
lack of awareness of gender is in the people doing this development. The head of the US government's like facial recognition testing program sends this email to his assistant about this report they're doing on gender recognition. And he says, you know, it would be really great if we could have some people in this binary, like highly stereotyped like system who, you know, like really messed with like its expectations to see like how it reacts. Open brackets, drag, close brackets. And that was the only thing he could think of. Like he was like, hmm, well, I know that there are men and then there are women and then there are drag performers and those are the three like types of people. And um, so, you know, all of these norms are baked into this system and they're baked into other AI systems as well, right? We can see the example that people brought in right at the beginning of like the welfare fraud. As someone from the UK, do you know how much of that like welfare fraud narrative is built that, that justifies like detecting fraud and that being the place we need an algorithm is built around uh, xenophobia and the UK's own particular like brand of racism and inherent classism and the fact that you know, the Tory party somehow has like 500 people, yet 3,000 double-barreled surnames and approximately four different DNA types. Like, it's this weird incestuous Bullingdon club of rich people and people the rich people sort of like ooze all over. Um, in the US, you know, you see those same conversations happening and there it's explicitly racialized as well, right? We're talking about welfare queens, we're talking about immigrants coming over here and like using our public services. And in fact, when facial recognition was first like developed in the public sector in 1993, within five years, the state of Pennsylvania had deployed it for checking for fruit, food stamps fraud. Like it has always been racialized, always been gendered, all of AI and all of this technology is. But the reason for that is not AI. I mean, it is as we know AI, but the reason for that really is that we live in a society that has those values, or a series of societies that have those values. That is the space in which we, are, we develop technology. That is the space in which we have these incentives, right? Is we have market incentives and then we have state incentives. And if you want to get something done, those are the two places you go. And the straight state is racist and the market is made up of people educated by the state who are racist and happy to make money off racism if it's profitable. And there we go down into like the global warming like death curve. And the last thing that anyone in the human race will ever hear is someone looking at like the parched desert where a river used to be and going, I wonder if I can make money off this in somehow. And so our challenge is not how do we defeat AI or how do we destroy AI. Our challenge is that we fundamentally have tools which have been built and shaped and are being evaluated in this wider societal context, in a context that is transphobic and racist and colonial and capitalist and misogynistic and queer phobic and has always been and will continue to be. So our actual challenge here is not necessarily how do we ban it, but how do we build systems that do better? And how do we do that in this context? And how do we as people who are inside data to a certain degree, uh, start building spaces which are prefigurative, spaces which have the values that we want wider society to see and to have? and demonstrate through doing so that those spaces are possible. And through doing so, do less harm. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Oz. I have already a lot of questions, but uh, we'll uh, make it later. Um, now I want to introduce Dan McKillan. He's a lecturer in creative and social computing at the Goldsmith College, uh, uh, the University uh, of Goldsmith in London. And uh, he has a PhD in experimental particle physics. And prior to the academic work, he worked uh, at Amnesty International. And uh, besides also your academic uh, background. I also want to say something that for me was very important uh, in uh, getting to know the profile of Dan because um, he was one of the 93 people that were 
uh, tortured and beaten by the police uh, during the G8 in Genoa in 2001. And this was something that for Italians was really, really strong moments of uh, reflection about the social movement and the practice we are doing because the police and the government did that. And uh, so we already had a lot of sharing about this. And I wanted to mention because um, his presentation will be about an anti-fascist AI. So I think it's also important to say that you don't speak only with an academic background, but also with somebody that really experienced the things from within. Um, and also with a political perspective of experience directly. So thank you very much for being here and I'm curious to hear more. Uh, good evening, and uh, thanks very much for being here. I uh, know from experience that it's not easy atmosphere with this humidity. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's true. Um, when I talk about fascism, it's not in the abstract. So, um, the arrival of AI <coughs> doesn't herald a new era of cyborg intelligence. It's not a transformation, but an intensification. Like bureaucracy, it's a generalizable mode of rational ordering. Like bureaucracy, it's based on abstraction and deriving authority from claims to neutrality and objectivity. The justification for bureaucratic rationality is efficiency. Machine learning adds inferential governance in the name of optimization, overriding social complexity through its objective function or loss function. In a neural network, the many weights of the model derived from backpropagation are strung out across the layers like a computational Indra's net. AI's claim is not simply that numbers don't lie, but that mathematics reveals a superior order of truth. It's an appeal that goes back to the origins of science and beyond, to the Neoplatonists of the fifth century. AI is the modern form of a very old dream although this dream has a big carbon footprint. As research out this month showed, training a single large AI model can emit as much carbon as the lifetime emissions of five cars. AI intensifies the erosion of due process through opacity, as it's hard to reverse machine calculation to human reasoning. Weber, the critic of bureaucracy, or the student of bureaucracy, who was a critic, noted that bureaucratic administration always tends to hide its knowledge and action from criticism as well as it can. We had not much as change as we know from Crofton's talk. But by operating through large-scale correlations, AI takes this opacity to a new level. Bureaucracy silos people's responsibilities and lets them feel that the wider harms being caused are nothing to do with them. The hyper-abstraction of AI intensifies thoughtlessness, in the sense that Hannah Arendt meant it. The inability to critique instructions, the lack of reflection on consequences, and a commitment to the belief that the correct ordering is being carried out. AI is a political question, not only because of what's to be done with it, but because of the political tendencies of the technology itself. The possibilities of AI arise from the resonances between its concrete operations and the surrounding political conditions. By influencing our understanding of what is both possible and desirable, it acts in the space between what is and what ought to be. The operations of AI are computational, shifting numbers in and out of registers. It achieves its insights by discriminating between its classes via an abstract distance in data space that is taken as an innate affinity. It's a logic of statistical segregation. But these patterns are based on correlation, not causality. However complex the computation, there's no comprehension or even common sense. The neural networks that seem to do so well at image classification are easily fooled by strange poses of familiar objects. So a school bus on its side is confidently classified as a snowplow. The product of AI is probabilities, like financialization and the metrics of new managerialism that precede it. 
AI sees society through categories of actuarial risk. Filtering people's lives through an epistemology of insurance and instrumentalism. AI can apparently prehend the coming of crime or Alzheimer's disease. It extends bureaucracy into the future. Or rather, it bureaucratizes a probabilistic future and actualizes it in the present. Google's Sidewalk Labs, for example, isn't simply a smart city panopticon. It's a time machine that transports you into a future judged to be optimal by the algorithms. As bureaucracy overflows into the streets, as inferential modulation reshapes our experience, the perennial protest slogan, whose streets, our streets, is optimized to whose streets, the algorithm streets. This ordering extends governmentality to the domain of intent, which it strives to preempt. As well as classifications of pre-extremism, that's a real category, as prototyped by the UK's prevent strategy, there will also be classifications that claim benevolent resource allocation, such as pre-diabetes or pre-dementia. The usual objection to algorithmic judgments is outrage at the false positives, especially when they result from biased input data. But the underlying problem is the imposition of an optimization based on a single idea of what's for the best with the resultant ranking of the deserving and the undeserving. Applied to social welfare, it becomes a calculative Victorianism, assigning morality via statistical metrics. It's an ethics of triage via the computerization of stigma. We've heard how the multiplication of categories increases potential moments for administrative violence. These clashes of classification will operate on all those already pushed towards marginal identities, and each example will bring its own collateral damage. The automatic assignment of class by an AI is a stochastic class war. Mark Fisher coined the term capitalist realism to describe the entrenched belief that despite the global financial crash, there's no alternative. What we're seeing now is AI realism while the reform of AI is endlessly discussed, there's no attempt to seriously question whether we should be using it at all. AI is seen as a way to square the circle between budget cuts and rising demand. This future is an extension of austerity, a perpetual winter of pared back social support justified by smart targeting. Where bureaucracy is the rule of the unimaginative, AI is the reductive imagineering of our social future. Research published in the UK last week shows that the Sure Start scheme, which funded children's centres in poor neighbourhoods, which my kids went to, saved the National Health Service millions of pounds. Yet that scheme is being cut, and councils are putting money into predictive analytics to target families for intervention by children's services. But because correlations are not causation, they tell us very little about the best ways to intervene. By only selecting for features that differentiate between individuals, they ignore the problems that people have in common. The simplification of social problems to optimization based on reductive reasoning and innate characteristics is a politics of populism. What institutional machine learning risks creating by default is a machine for the agile construction of populist targets. The algorithmic coupling of vectorial distance and social difference will become the easiest way to administer a hostile environment, such as the one created by Theresa May in the UK to target immigrants. AI realism is only one step from the analytics of the far right. The dream of artificial general intelligence, which many in Silicon Valley are still working towards, is swept by associations between IQ and race. While the new statistical correlations of genome-wide association studies, 
you should check them out, naturalizes inequalities in income and attainment while bolstering the race realism of white supremacists. Under current conditions, there are only two probable routes for socially applied AI. The extension of austerity or a gradient descent towards fascism. But the AI counter-revolution contains the seeds of its own supersession in the hollowness of its promises, as it becomes clear that rather than a sci-fi future, we're to be left behind in computationally optimized deprivation. The predictive pattern recognition of deep learning is being brought to bear on our lives. Either we'll be ordered by it, or we will organize. So the question of an anti-fascist AI is the question of self-organization and of the autonomous production of the self that is organizing. When striving for a non-oppressive AI, we can take some guidance from feminist and decolonial technology studies that cast doubt on our cast iron ideas about objectivity and neutrality. Standpoint theory suggests that positions of social and political disadvantage can become sites of analytical advantage through their situated perspectives. Likewise, a feminist ethics of care takes relationality as fundamental. Establishing a relationship between the inquirer and their subject of inquiry overcomes AI's onlooker consciousness. A counterpower, which is what we need, a counterpower to bureaucracy and its AI upgrade must be created in and for itself, not as a temporary gift from an institution. It requires parallel structures that mobilize community concerns, structures such as workers' councils and people's councils. Not all responses to the financial crash were capitalist realist. In February 2012, some workers who'd been laid off from the Viomi factory in Thessaloniki broke back in and decided to run things themselves. Former machine operators learned about strategy and sales, and now they run things through daily general assemblies. Once set in motion, the tendency towards self-management unlocks wider solidarities. The Google walkout is a start, but AI workers need a vision as powerful as, but different to, the transhumanist hubris of their parent corporations. They need to know that by organizing, they're forming the structure of the new society within the shell of the old. An anti-fascist AI involves people's councils to put the perspective of marginalized groups at the core of AI practice and to transform machine learning into a form of critical pedagogy. People's councils are face-to-face -face democratic assemblies, a horizontally organized refusal to be rendered as data. They're a collective questioning of the decisions that define the way machines will make decisions. They're transformative because they're constitutive of different subjectivities. The iterative deliberation of consensus, done right, is an antidote to bureaucracy and to the calculative iterations of machine learning. People's councils apply Bergson's critique of ready-made problems, whose solution is simply a matter of probabilistic deduction. To have agency is to reinvent the problem. The possible is something creative, unpredictable, non-calculable. Statistical reductiveness is reversed through a commitment to the possible over the probable. Like Ivan Illich, people's councils value a convivial technology and are prepared to apply limits. The era of AI may require a new Luddite movement. Like the residents and parents in Chandler, Arizona, who have blockaded Waymo's self-driving vans. They didn't ask us if we wanted to be part of their beta test, said a mother whose child was nearly hit by one. The Luddites, let's remember, weren't anti-technology, but aimed to put down all machinery hurtful to the commonality.
we need to develop a different order of ordering. Instead of ways of organizing that allow everyone to evade responsibility, we need to reclaim our own agency through self-organization. Only under these conditions will we discover whether a reimagined machine learning can become a people's technology. Asking how can we predict who will do X is asking the wrong question. We already know the destructive consequences on the psyche of poverty, racism, and neglect. We don't need AI as targeting, but as something that helps to raise up whole populations. I'd suggest that the liberatory potential of AI is ludic, not as a form of ordering, but as a form of playful disordering, a disordering of the senses to reveal the possibilities hidden by the dead weight of data capitalism. Maybe AI can help us with our necessary dreams of a better future, if we can transcend the dark contents of its collective unconscious, such as the mathematics of statistical regression, which were developed for the eugenicist dreams of Francis Galton and Carl Pearson. We don't want predictive politics. We want prefigurative politics for our actions and relations right now to embody the better society we want to live in. The mathematics of AI is a trap, not only because of its alliances with external politics, but also because it resonates with the calculative cruelties that lurk inside us. Overcoming internalized structures is not only a matter of individual self-transformation, it's a collective project. An anti-fascist AI is not only a matter of blocking far-right tendencies, but of challenging our own everyday authoritarianism. It needs to come through collective practices of refusing to be dominated, but also of refusing to dominate anyone else by rejecting participation in oppressive patterns of interaction. We can start doing this wherever we come together. Disengaging from the orderings we're presented with and self-organizing our own collective autonomy. This simple act is way more sophisticated than any AI could, could be or will ever be. An anti-fascist AI is a project based on solidarity, mutual aid, and collective care. We don't need autonomous machines, but a technics that's part of a movement for social autonomy. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dan. So now I have a question for each of you, and then uh, I would like to open to the public. So I want to start with Dia, and uh, I was really struck by the definition of uh, authentic uh, identity, or uh, the, the authenticity of identity, <laughs> that I find that really, uh, you know, a contradiction by itself, because uh, we were just discussing this when we speak about identity, it's really difficult to speak about uh, authenticity and what is an authentic identity. So I think, uh, I mean, until now we really discuss on the idea that identity is a multiple com context and it also is a construction. Um, so by referring to this discourse, uh, speaking about AI, we completely see that is not anymore a technological problem, but is a cultural problem. Because if we start with the definition of identity as something authentic, then means that already, you know, the bias is put into the process. Um, so this is my question for you, because then I say, how we can, you know, intervene into technology uh, when the problem is cultural. And so if we speak about so the idea of content moderation, that as you were saying, is also really a technological uh, you know, effect on people, how can we do a sort of reverse engineering into the cultural paradigm and try to change it? So can we do it from within or has to be done with society at large? Uh, how the transformation can be actually done? 
question for me or for the speaker? Well, I mean, I would like for you, but then of course the others can come and... Uh, oh, sorry, I have to like, use the microphone. Yeah, yeah. But I have a question for each of you. Anyway, if you also want to comment, you, you can do. Um, sure. So I, uh, actually, I, I think um, one notable thing is uh, in that conversation around um, who was going to be allowed on Facebook, immediately one of the things that was the most useful was people doing a physical protest outside of Facebook headquarters. So. Um, Actually, speaking to this idea of people's councils, uh, this is something that people are pushing for in content moderation. Um, and of course, Facebook has responded with uh, their, their oversight advisory board. It's supposed to be, if people haven't heard about this, um, after lots of pressure, Facebook decided that it's gonna address the twin issues of freedom of expression and safety by creating an external board that will review content decisions. Um, there are huge questions. Uh, we could talk about that all day. Actually, that's what I spent a lot of last week talking about, um, both with people from Facebook and with activists from around the world, um, asking lots of questions like, where are they going to pick the people? You know, how is it actually going to be independent from Facebook? So instead of all of that, um, which really just like we know is going to be bullshit, right? Um, people, people are organizing. Uh, the the um, this group that I've been working with started out of, um, called the, the Next Billions Network. It's people, uh, Next Billion refers to the emerging markets because that's how Facebook sees people, right? They don't see people as people, they see them as markets. Um, India being a huge, a huge one and so, um, and also Southeast Asia. So there are people who are organizing who um, wrote these letters, these Dear Mark letters. There was a big surge of them. Um, and we are coming together. We're talking at conferences. We are thinking about how we can strategically respond. Um, so people, people are fighting for their own identities. Um, and, and I will say, uh, just from a harm reduction perspective, because people are still on Facebook and because it's a, it's a very important space for a lot of people, um, the name policy still sucks. But one thing I will say, they took out the, the phrase authentic identity from that, and they took that phrase from us in the, in the first place. In all of these conversations, we, were, we would go to these, these meetings at the Facebook headquarters where they would be like, welcome, uh, please enjoy our cereal bar. I'm sure that makes up for being kicked off of Facebook for being trans. Um, it, it, it's really good cereal. <laughs> So anyway, we would go to all these meetings and, you know, um, they would talk to us and then they would take our language and they would distort it and they would feed it back to us. And the phrase authentic selves and authentic identity came from the representative from the Transgender Law Center who was going to the meetings and saying we want to be our authentic. And we, we also used it, um, but they really took that phrase and literally put it in the policy as, as PR. Um, all of that being said, you can do things, and actually this is a tip I want everyone to know. If you know folks who get kicked off of Facebook for violating the names policy, you can use, you don't have to send them a government issued ID, and you can send them a membership card. So I actually, I actually wish, an, or like a piece of mail, um, all these other things. Like, um, any, any uh, resource center in Berlin could issue you a membership card with your preferred name and your date of birth. And, you, and, and a photo, and you could use that if you ever get stuck in their, um, in their name. So we have actually figured out some sort of workaround, but that's, that's also really reflective of kind of all, like so much organizing in politics today, right? We're just trying to get by and, and survive within the system even as we're fighting back. Um, so that's, that's why I'm gonna push it on my other panelists and say like, what's next? What do we, what do, we do keeping in mind, keeping in mind that like folks are using they're going to continue using Facebook and WhatsApp because they have data plans that give them free access to these services. Um, they, have, you know, they have old Androids. Uh, they are not going to be using Signal because they're not going to like get those messages with their bad internet service. I was just in Tun Tunisia, like, I would get messages, I would get responses in groups before I got the original message. Um, you know, so so what do we do? How do we how do we push past that? So I disrupt my own idea here, and I think uh, that if you want to answer uh, to Dia, you can already do your part. <laughs> and then I will do my question if later. If you have something to say, of course. No. Okay. <laughs> so my idea of disrupting myself didn't work. Okay, so um, 
Eh? I got disrupted, yeah, yeah. So it's like a cycle. <laughs> um, so for uh, us, um, I mean, I read the, you, the wonderful paper that you wrote that uh, was about the human-computer interaction, and uh, you didn't mention that. Why? So I think that since we were speaking about the anti-fascist AI, we should also bring a bit of anarchism here. So, and uh, um, so my question would also be how uh, we could, uh, you know, speak about uh, a situated perspective that comes from the minority in solving this really big issue uh, of uh, abstraction and how do we solve this dilemma in a way because uh, how can a subjectivity uh, in a sense uh, uh, fight something that is based on abstraction that is uh, exactly the opposite of uh, you know the the subjectivity for itself so i don't know if you want to answer to that but i also wanted you to mention this paper because I find it really great and it's really great concept, the one of the uh, human computing interaction. Yeah, so um, the, the core question I think is um, one that a large number of philosophers are still throwing like cups at each other about, but uh, like subjectivity and objectivity and which one matters and how they interact and articulate. I, I guess I would say that um, the idea of objectivity is, is bullshit, and we all know it's bullshit. Um, objective systems are just subjective systems with a gun to your head. That is the only difference. Um, and, and that is kind of the crucial thing, right? It's, it's power. Um, that is the difference between an experience we call objective and scientific and real and uh, an experience we call subjective. It's how many generations of like white men with like inherited titles fucked around with beakers in their spare time to like create this discipline. If it's more than 500, we call you physics. If it's less than 500, we call you biology or chemistry. And if it's about like 3,000 and none of them own pants, well, we call it philosophy. Um, you know, this idea of objectivity is nonsense. And um, generally speaking, I think the answer to like, how do we, we fight back is not there is no one answer. Like that's that's sort of like the point. We can't we can't say that like, you know, experiences are contextual and not also recognize that like ways of responding are contextual. There are going to be like some people who are in a position where they are inside the tent enough to to start yelling at people. And then there are gonna be some people who are outside and it's cold and they just really need in the goddamn tent. And I don't think that there's going to be like one solution or that there is like one appropriate way of, of responding to these like big artifices. Um, and, and generally speaking, like that is, that is the only thing that I do hold to be universally true is um, that a diversity of tactics and a diversity of approaches is the only way to do this that is prefigurative, that, that holds to the politics that it wishes to see in the world that it is creating. Um, and the, the test for like what is the best way to like kneecap Facebook is the people in the space where you are who are most marginalized by Facebook and the systems it supports. What alleviates their distress? Like what gives them hope? What do they need right now? Okay, do that thing. But at the same time, I must also recognize that you know there there is a tension there, right? Like so so dear, you bring up the example of like people are uh, sort of like fighting with Facebook to like get this policy changed and like get on. And, and there is this, this weird discursive tension which um, before I, I claimed that it was my thought somehow, it's my advisor's thought, um, a professor called Anna Lauren Hoffman whose work I suspect you would all love. Um, but it's, it's basically on uh, this weird thing that happens when a data system is discriminatory. It's discriminatory, it hurts people, they fight back the system adapts to include those people. And then the people who run the system get credit for being such good allies and so aware. Like we're letting you participate in our marketing panopticon. Like we're allowing you to give us your data to sell on to third parties to out you to your parents on some random website. Aren't we such good people? And I think navigating that particular tension is, is the real trickiness. Um, 
and yeah, and I wrote a paper called uh, Human Computer Insurrection, Notes on an Anarchist HCI, which is an... A I advise people to read. Yeah, it is a manifesto for an explicitly anarcho-communist HCI. It also cites the Talmud, and it also, because I've always wanted to see if I could get away with it, cites the Unabomber. Um, in, in a footnote making fun of the Unabomber, just to be clear. Um, but it's, it's very good, and every single time I've presented it somewhere, the first question that everyone who's in my field has had is, how the fuck did you get that published? <laughs> like, how did you get the ACM to publish a paper on anarcho-communism? And I'm like, I have no idea. I don't know if they've realized that that's what they did. <laughs> Great. Um, so, and my last question for then, then we open to the public. Um, I really, you know, enjoy your... Uh, you, you call it uh, reading poetry. Um, and, uh, but then, you know, we are at the Disruption Lab, we also like to go really grounded on the problem. So I like the idea that you mentioned the People Council and uh, also the possibility of imagining something different, uh, uh, like, uh, you know, to instead of just uh, speaking about uh, a different order also to imagine a form of disorder. So the question would be, because I uh, saw that you were referring a lot to the discourse of the workers and ladies, but at the same time you also mentioned the situated perspective and feminism, and I find this a bit of a contradiction, so I wanted you to elaborate a bit more on the idea of, uh, so are we speaking about a different order or a disorder? And also in all these, uh, you know, paradigm, what can we really do concretely uh, if we speak about people council to build up an alternative? Is that all? Yes. <laughs> it's a long, a bit complex okay. question. I'll, um, I'll, I'll, have, I'll take that, as my son would say. Um, yeah, so, I guess not me. Uh, yeah, contradictions. So uh, I suppose there are definitely historical contradictions between the uh, particular politically paradigmatic traditions I'm talking about. Th that's fine. Okay. I think Deleuze has a nice quote about philosophy being a toolbox. I think um, I'm trying to find ways to express our current set of dilemmas that aren't simply repeating the bit that I tried to draw attention to, which is trying to solve things with concepts that are already part of the problem. And while that might sound like a philosophical question, I don't think it really is. I think there's plenty of other, uh, either for, you know, other cultures or other periods in our, in, in our history, whatever that means, that we can look to for other ways of doing this. I, I actually wanted to come back on the question of, of objectivity. I, I, you know, I'm with the panel and everybody else. I don't believe in objectivity like that. Okay, but I'm a scientist, right? Originally, that's my background. And that doesn't mean I've completely abandoned it. Okay, I think it's a hugely problematic project. But I think, as one of the questioners was saying earlier on, it's actually really important with this stuff to pay attention to the detail, the actual technical operations of these things, because they are, they are in conversation with our ideologies. You know, and the way you were drawing attention to that in terms of subject formation, it's the same with our concept formation, right? These very specific modes of probabilistic deduction are in dialogue with our understandings of what the world is about and what it can be. So it's important to be very specific. But actually, as I was trying to speak to at the end, the spontaneous form, as I think you really reinforced for me, the spontaneous form in which people in general, when faced with an unsustainable, intolerable, unbearable situation, have tended to react, is to form collective structures and discuss what to do. Mm -hmm. So actually, maybe I should reformulate my question because it was actually really concrete. Uh, since when you were um, speaking about people council, do you imagine that this is only council of workers, of people working on AI? or also is, uh, you know, expanding to the larger society, and then we include also, you know, the more relative minority subjectivity point of view. So when you speak about people council, how do you envision this? So we also, you know, give a sure. message. Uh, I suppose I'm, I'm 
thinking about people's councils as the second thing you were describing. For me, workers' council, actually, that is one area in our current sort of apocalyptic period that actually doesn't seem so bleak to me. In my little world, there is actually quite a lot of, well, when I say a lot, there are beginning signs of the return of fighting unionism. Okay, organized workers as an idea is coming back. Actually, funnily enough, in the most precarious workplaces, the delivery drivers, you know, the academics, okay, you know, all the precariat. So workers, I think, it's, it's you know, the, the, the concept is already there. But people's councils is more about the rest of us on the receiving end of this stuff, in particular domains. Like, I, I, I'm trying to work at the moment with a group of uh, user-led, they call user-led organizations, specifically around mental health, but also disability, to try to basically prototype this idea and say, you know, let's just start from the position that you are in charge of this, okay? You should have the final say. Whether or not that's accepted or whether or not it's, they attempt to assimilate it as, you know, a stage we have to tackle. But start from that position. Start from the position of saying, okay, firstly, what the hell is this stuff? What is it going to do? What is it already doing? And what do we want to see instead? What kind of world do we want to live in? What kind of, for example, in this case, how do we want mental health to be, uh, to be in society? And actually, I just wanted to mention that as well because I didn't get a chance to squeeze it in there and I knew I was on a tight time limit, that it's interesting. I really think it's more than, more than, uh, a, more than a coincidence that mental health comes up so much in these kind of areas because as well as being techno-political, this stuff is also psycho-political, okay? It affects deep structures of our, not just our sense of self, but our, I would say, you know, deep, deeper than that, right? Our soul, in a way, okay? And it does its damage there as well. And I think that's what we can see in, in our current times. And that is also a political issue and that is also related to the structures of rational ordering that we choose to adopt or not. Thank you. And now I think if you, do you want to add something to this or we open to the public? I would say, since we speak about people council, let's <laughs> open it. And so, yeah, please, who has questions? Ah, there is already one there, yes. Start. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. thank, thank you so much for uh, your interesting input and in particular you, Dan, for your beautiful presentation. Um, I, I have a comment and a question which are connected. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to pick on one of your points, uh, Dan, um, on, on this carbon footprint. By accident, I also knew this ACL paper uh, and I just, so, so I think the basis for, for this calculation is some super complex model they submitted to a super big competition. So I guess my point there would be that like critiquing machine learning research on the basis of this is like critiquing space re research on the basis of the carbon footprint of a rocket launch basically, which is, 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 is a particular incident. And I, I think the, the, the bigger point I'm trying to make is actually what you also said in the end that um, we should focus on the details, on actual problems, and, and not just like feast on, 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 on headlines or anecdotes. And I felt one of the big problems that emerged from, from your guys' input, for me at least, was this, this issue of attribution. So you, you talked a lot about uh, gender, gender categories, and I mean, I, I feel like behind this is, there's this one question, which categories should there be? And then there's also the second question, should there be categories at all? And one of the premises, I think, in machine learning, or a big important premise, is actually, is classification, is attribution. So I'm feeling that uh, this interesting point that emerges from, uh, fr from this discussion is, which, which domains do we, want or do we want to have attributions in? So this is, I think, a nego negotiation we should have. So there's gender, then Dan also talked about bureaucracy. So I'm wondering if you share this sentiment and if you see other areas where we should be critical about, about using attribution, using classification, and yeah. 
Thank you. Some, some context. Um, my, my grand advisors, uh, so my advisors' advisors, uh, literally wrote the book on classification theory. It is called Sorting Things Out, Classification and Its Consequences, and it is about how every classification choice is invariably a political decision that harms some. There's, the question is not what categories do we use. The question is, why do we in this room feel like we get to decide what categories the world should use at all? The question is, what are you using them for? Who is covered? What are the consequences? And once you've answered those three questions, the next answer is, go ask them. So, um, yes, actually. <laughs> so, um, I don't know who here has heard about this Christchurch call. Um, this is a civil society, well, no, I'm sorry. It's a government and company statement that was spearheaded by New Zealand and France in response to the live streaming of the Christchurch shootings. And the statement has this crappy language that's also in the European terrorist content regulation that says that um, companies need to be proactively detecting and immediately and permanently removing content, extremist content, which as I, um, I hope you're all convinced is not gonna be angry white supremacist men talking about uh, things I'm not gonna say. Um, it's gonna be content coming from Syria, coming from Yemen, coming from Myanmar, content that is incredibly important for um, uh, justice processes. And um, I just wanna be clear, like, so we, um, we actually gave some input to the New Zealand government. We wrote a white paper with EFF and Syrian Archive. If you're interested in evidentiary value of extremist content, check it out. But, um, but in my input into the civil society response to that, um, nobody had said this yet. I was just really clear. I was like, we have to be clear. You cannot use machine learning algorithms to judge content right now. So um, yeah, you know, it's not about, sometimes it's not about building something better. Uh, we live in an era of technological solutionism. Um, we live in an era where funding and research and big global NGOs that wanna talk about that stuff, get the money, um, people are, you know, people are being positively rewarded for putting out some bullshit that's not going to help anyone. I'm sorry. Um, so in, in, the, in the case of content moderation, no, we just shouldn't be using machine learning algorithms at all right now. Yeah. Uh, Ryan? Hello. Well, uh, I mean, as far as the classifications, I'd just like to concur because, um, but you know, just say, of course, classifications, of course, we all use them all the time, right? But we use them and I think we constantly renegotiate them, right? So that's one issue really, because that's not how machine learning works. But, but maybe more than that, my beef is not just with the classification, it's with the operations on the classification, right? If, if there's a problem right now, it's optimization. Okay, optimization is going, becoming, I think. You know, look at the scale of operations behind the scenes of tendering by the UK government. These are all optimizing systems. Okay, Optimiz optimization is becoming, uh, you know, a, a, dominant, a dominant logic. And I think that needs to be challenged. Actually, I'm also against, you talked about bureaucracy. I'm, I also think efficiency is bullshit. Okay, it's total bullshit. Huh? Okay. Okay, okay, um, but I don't know about their problem, but my problem with it is because you can't even calculate efficiency you do, until you do this reduction of everything to something calculable, right? So it's, I think it's total bullshit. Um, I just want to come back to you on the carbon thing, right? I haven't taken that paper to task, but I do think this is coming back to the concrete thing. I think it's really interesting. There's a good blog post on OpenAI, you know OpenAI? There's a good blog post called AI and Compute from May 16th. And it's so between Alex, AlexNet and AlphaGo, that's three times 10 to the five increase, three times 10 to the five increase in compute, right? The, pe I think people should be aware of the utter insanity, right, by which these incredibly clever machines that can play stupid games are being developed, right, and then rolled out systems that will control crime and Alzheimer's and climate change, okay? It's an absolutely phenomenal exercise in resource diversion right, into giant data centers. And we should be aware of that and we should challenge it. Whether that paper's bullshit or not, I can't really know. 
Another question over there. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for all of your talks. Uh, uh, some very useful and tactical thinking. Uh, I think I'm going to have many questions, but but because of what Dan's article brings up for me, and uh, and one of the strongest of sort of the techno-critical perspectives uh, that is looking sort of outside the the technical resistance. Uh, I, I was just at an Anthropocene conference last week, and I think the environmental collapse sort of puts us into a new picture and somehow we need to think more radically and different and in terms of how we organize ourselves to to get out of the the crises that we're in and i'll bring up an analogy since there was a lot of u.s perspective here today of like in a struggle with rosa La rosa parks uh fighting uh for a, a certain position in the in a bus uh, I think in terms of the technology, we're now like to fight for a position within the bus that's going off the cliff is somehow highly problematic and that we need to think of like exit strategies from the techno-fascism that we are immersed in because as Dan's article, which I would love to read in full uh, to review it again and think about it, uh, I don't think there's a way to utilize AI, as Os is saying, to, or, or to utilize the technosphere as our way to radically rethink how we're going to um, fight back against the, the, f the different forms of fascism that are, that are coming upon us with the ecological crisis over our heads. So I wonder if you could respond more to that, like do you think the game is changing with the uh, authoritarianism that's rising and the ecological uh, threats that they are responding to with this technology to deal with. Thank you. Who wants to get it? <laughs> you? Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty bad, isn't it? Uh, I mean, of course, I don't really have any answers to this, but um, I mean, I feel your, the, the picture you paint is, you know, is somewhat resonates with, with what I'm trying to say. I particularly think there's a danger, just to, to riff on the optimization thing, of AI actually being promoted as part of the technical solution to climate change, which is clearly a disaster. Um, I don't know if it's, it's too late, but I would say that from my political tradition, you know, people have been experiencing apocalyptic conditions for a long time, okay? And th there's never really been any other answer than to resist, okay, and to organize. So I think that's, um, Im and it's impossible to really answer for me. I'm, you know, I, I actually quite like AI or machine learning. You know, I think it's a lot of fun, right? I don't think it's useless. I think it's mainly a lot of fun as a kind of creative tool. I certainly wouldn't put it in charge of anything serious. Uh, but it may have other uses, you know, maybe, maybe AI is good for managing, you know, uh, household level massively distributed solar arrays in a way that we couldn't do before. I don't know, maybe it has a role. But we won't, you know, you know the joke about asking a guy the way? And you, say, you ask him the way and he says, if you want to get there, I wouldn't start from here. You know what I mean? It's like, we have to, <laughs> we have to kind of reverse the, the starting point in order to find out whether any of this technical stuff has any part in, in a future. I don't know. I, I, I don't know, basically. Yeah, maybe a question a bit more concrete and positive. <laughs> Otherwise we go home, we, you know, of course there are problems, but let's see also how we can do together to solve. <laughs> yeah, you or? Okay, so let's do this and then you. Hi, thank you all so much for your talks. Um, I have a question, it seems to me, also the talk of Mutale. Um, a lot of the issues discussed seem to have perhaps not 100% to do with AI, but also with visuality and with the hegemony of visuality as something that, um, a visual registration as something that is um, much more reductive than other senses, perhaps. 
um, especially with facial recognition and, well, in Mutale's talk, it, this element was very strong. So how many, how much of the problems that we've been discussing today have actually perhaps more to do with visuality than AI uh, in itself, as a problem that goes further back in history as well, uh, visual registration as something that makes this claim uh, to objectivity, uh, the god trick um, that also extricates the observer from the observed um, and therefore uh, fails to create a situation for accountability um, so that doesn't implicate uh, the observer. Um, and um, my, my other question would be kind of in connection to that. Um, whether, and this is, I, I really love this uh, idea, Dan, of the disordering of the senses, and also in connection to what you were saying about a feminist um, ethics of care, to imagine an AI that would not be predominantly based on visuality, but on something other, such as, for example, touch. And I do realize this is completely unfeasible, so it would be a, a speculative, imaginative, rather artistic endeavor, uh, whether it would be fruitful, perhaps, or helpful in thinking about um, what the problem is, to imagine uh, something like that with touch being something intrinsically reciprocal, right? Where the observer, you cannot be, you cannot touch without being touched. Um, sorry if this is a very speculative question. I also have no idea how I would answer it, but it's an idea. Um, it would be, yeah. Uh, so I think that visuality is definitely part of the problem. Um, I don't think it's the, the only problem. Um, you know, many of the senses involve uh, uh, questions of, of, you know, lack of uh, consent and lack of um, correctability and accountability. Um, as you point out, you know, touch is, is in some ways uh, not one of them. Um, and I also think that, you know, in some cases, like, vi it is a concern of visuality and not of AI. Like, if we pick a, an alternate example, um, in, in the US, you are, uh, companies are required to um, collect the gender and race data of like a certain percentage of their employees. Um, and the reason is not so that the employees can have access to this in any way. The reason is for government tracking of diversity and like, you know, employment opportunities. Um, but actually filling the form out is optional. Um, and so there is a risk that a company will fall below the minimum threshold of the percentage of employees that it needs. And so the US government's instruction for what to do if your company falls below the threshold or is going to um, is to take copies of this form and wander around your office and look at people and guess. And then fill the form out and return it to its rightful place. Um, so, so you can see simultaneously the way that like visuality has played this role without the need for AI to be involved and also the way that power has played a role here, right? Like, you know, it's, it's um, an HR manager as the agent for the US state versus like some like junior office like squib who's just trying to work out how the pencil sharpener works. Um, and I think that, that there's definitely like, you know, work in, in sort of changing sensory aspects. I'm not sure how a touch-based AI would work, although I always love speculative design. Um, I, I guess my sort of question and my work is less to do with the input method um, and more to do with like the, the reasoning and the power structures within which these exist. Um, there is a, a book uh, from the mid 90s uh, by uh, uh, Alison Adam called uh, Gender and the Thinking Machine, which is about like traditional AI and it's analyzing it through this feminist epistemological lens and it is all still incredibly applicable. Um, and, and it ends with this chapter that is just like speculation and attempts to build a feminist AI. So not just an AI that like, you know, has altered power relations, but an AI built on like feminist epistemic principles and like feminist principles of care. And, and so like, honestly, right now I'm, I'm looking at that and sort of thinking about like, okay, how can we use what we know now to expand on that? Um, uh, gender and the thinking machine, uh, Alison Adam. Uh, it's very good and spends most of its time kicking Marvin Minsky hard in the ribs, which is always fun to see. I mean, he, he'd sort of gone fetal, I think, by the end. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I mean, I don't, yeah, that's it. Uh, the, the, I don't see, I, I think I totally relate to the, the problems you're talking about, but I don't see them, for me, it's not 
I, would, I don't understand it primarily as a problem of visuality. I mean, it seems to me you are describing actually the problem with science. That, I mean, you, the language you're using, right? And, uh, you know, I think Oz has already said, I mean, this is what's exciting for me as well, actually, that this area, you know, as a former physicist, right, as a self-exiled unscientist, you know, I've found a way back through feminist and post-colonial theories of science, right? But it's just theory. It's ideas. They seem powerful. They make sense to me. But I don't have any way, you know, to practice that. I, I don't think it's very easy to practice that in the current scientific framings. But actually, it's extremely practical when it comes to AI. It's exactly how, if we can imagine doing AI differently, it should be done. And I can't remember the I was going to mention a book as well, but I can't remember the name of it. But it's by Andrew Pickering. Somebody could probably remember the British cybernetics history. What's it called? The, no, the, no, no. Cybernetic revolutions, I think. It's, it's the same guy who did the mangle. But it's, it's this really bonkers history of forgotten British cyberneticists who had all sorts of, I don't know whether they did tactile, but they did like organic, you know, they put sort of half computer, half pond. You know, stuff like that was really, because it was coming from a, a different era and a different, uh, a different striving, a different aspiring to what might be uh, possible technical futures, which never came to pass, right? And that's why it makes it interesting. So, um, yeah. So, we have a question over there. Please yeah. keep it short. It's short, it's short. Yeah, good. Yeah, I'm, I, this, the question is, why are we doing this at all, the tech? The, the AI, the internet, it just, so, you know, if you, I think there's, there's lots of answers to that. It depends on who you ask. I like to take the example of, say, the Android um, phone operating system. People say, what's that for? Oh, it's for making phone calls. It's for keeping in touch with your friends. It's for checking the weather. No, it's actually a tracking device designed to collect a lot of data, which is designed then to train AIs. So, if, if you, we don't really know what the internet is for, we don't really know what the tech is for, so the question is, if you had to create some kind of a declaration or statement about what the ethical value of any of this would be, like, I, I want, wouldn't want to put anybody on the spot and say, come up with that now, but do you have any ideas or references of, like, like what should it be for? Um, you know, I I something like, oh, bettering the quality of life for all sentient beings or something like that. But is there any real uh, tangible work on, like, why, why, why do we want tech as, as a race? Can I, can I um, start this one off? Yeah. So you know what, it, what the answer wouldn't be is the Declaration of the Independence of Society of Space. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, because that is some colorblind bullshit. And also, anybody who likes that, uh, that piece of writing, I encourage you to go read his, um, his 25th anniversary, his blog post where he talked about writing it, where he literally said he had cyber geishas at his elbow refilling his champagne glasses. Give me a fucking break, dude. Um, so it shouldn't be that. Um, but what you're asking is like asking what should electricity be for or, um, you know, what should cars be for or what should anything be for? Technology is what it is for, what you decide it's for, what you make it, you know, and, that, and the incredible thing is that people have taken a stupid yearbook, an internet yearbook, and they have created archives of bombings in Syria. They have created archives of ethnic cleansing. They have created the best health resources that most transgender teens are gonna find. Um, that's, so that's what the internet is for, as far as I'm concerned. You know, it's for um, some of the things that maybe the Declaration of, of the Independence of Cyberspace could have talked about, um, but didn't, because it was written by a white man. Um, so, you know, it, it, we, we take it and we make it our own um, as much as we can within all of the constraints that we've been talking about, which is, you know, who, who holds the power and, and who's making decisions and how can we try to take it back and how can we um, use the master's tools to bring down the master's house, right? Like, all of it, it's complicated. Uh, but that being said, I still can go online and get really important information that I couldn't get elsewhere right now, today.
So we have now time for the last question. Yes. Yeah, great. I'll, I'll keep it short. What would uh, a post-colonial or, or anti-colonial um, feminist AI look like? Is it even possible? And I, I really mean AI, not just technology, um, for anyone who wants to take this. This was actually the... And I say this as an AI researcher, so... <laughs> There is a Lilia Rani paper called Postcolonial Computing, and I would thoroughly encourage people who are interested in the answer to that question to read it. Which is also my answer to like the previous question was, um, there are three things in the world I hate. People in New York who walk slowly. N ideal ethics, and people who treat AI like it's its own thing that's separated from society. If we accept that AI is imbricated in society as a technology, then we must also accept that we don't need some special ethical code just for AI. The answer to what ethical code should AI follow is what ethical code should society follow. And that's the thing that people have been studying for a really long time. And I'm tired of us reinventing the wheel just because Luciano Floridi makes the prospect of actually engaging with ethics theory for anyone in this space a, a extremely depressing prospect. For anyone who doesn't know who I'm talking about and what I'm talking about, you are better off not knowing. For anyone who does, yes, I am probably in trouble when I open my phone and check Twitter. Okay, so with this note, <laughs> I would say that I want to finish also with a positive note um, because, uh, you know, we were discussing what are these uh, council of people and I think, uh, you are not listening to me, hey, uh, I'm saying that, uh, disorder, yes. So we were discussing about the council of people, I think in these two days we have been one of these council. And uh, so I think this is a positive note to conclude because I would say that uh, perhaps this is the work we have to still, you know, keep doing, uh, discuss about these things, uh, try to, you know, bring literacy, uh, try to make people aware, uh, discuss among each other, and also, you know, spread the word on imagining a different kind of culture. Uh, so with this positive note, I would like to thank you for this great panel, uh, and also to the public. Thank you. And so, so now I liberate you from this stage. <laughs> and instead I call up my dear collaborator, Lieke. <laughs> Thank you very much, dear Os and Dan. And we finish with our little announcement as usual for the future events. So thank you very much. Uh, so we made it <laughs> with this heat. And yeah. <laughs> so we want now to announce uh, um, the, we are going to do an index event uh, in September, but first there is also the community program event that Lika is going to introduce. Yeah, so like we talked about briefly yesterday, we're also running a, a program called Activation, a community program like around the lab, so around the main conferences, which is supported now by the Guerrilla Foundation. And we're going to do our next meetup on the topic of this conference. So we're going to talk further on, on AI bias and specifically on how to review and transform algorithmic inequality uh, with some initiatives from right here in Berlin. So the meetup is going to be on the 26th of June at a place called State Studio. And this is in Berlin Schöneberg near Kleispark. And the initiatives we invited are uh, Open Schufa, the Open Schufa project. This was a project done by uh, Open Knowledge Foundation Germany and Algorithm Watch, and they worked since last year on unveiling the algorithm which is behind the Schufa credit score in Germany. So this is something which has actually a lot of direct impact on people's lives in Germany, but it's very unclear how the score is calculated and whether this is done fairly. So they're going to join us because they did a big uh, data donation campaign to find out how the algorithm actually works, and they're going to tell us more about what they did and what they found out. And secondly, we also invited the Oracle for Trans Feminist Technologies, uh, which is something really amazing, which was recently developed uh, by Clara Giuliano of Coding Rights. 
and this was also part of the super fer the first super feminist tech fellowship and this is a, a speculative co-design card game which opens up the debate on algorithmic bias by radically reimagining what AI could look like if it's built around trans feminist values and this is also something that we can actually try out at the meetup so you can also play the game afterwards so yeah I hope to see many of you also there if you're interested in discussing it more mm -hmm. And uh, so then we also take the opportunity to announce uh, the next program of the Disruption Network Club. We have the conference in September, the 20th, 21st, that is called Citizen of Evidence. And uh, we have already great speakers that have been confirmed, but uh, I just want to mention one. Uh, <clears throat> we will have with us Matthew uh, Caruana Galizia, that is the son of Daphne Caruana Galizia, that uh, was the uh, investigative journalist that was uh, exposing the corruption of the government uh, um, in uh, Malta and was uh, assassinated in uh, 2017. And so this reporting has been connected also with their work on the Panama Papers and anti-corruption. So uh, we will have Matthew with us that has been also working on the Panama Papers uh, but also bringing uh, the discourse uh, of the importance of the doing uh, uh, civic journalism and uh, having the citizen uh, active to expose misconducts and uh, denounce evidence. So uh, this will be a connection with our previous conference uh, of April uh, that was called Dark Havens. Um, and we will keep working on the discourse of anti-corruption, but from uh, a point of view of the citizens and also the idea of exposing misconducts from below. So a form of whistleblowing that comes from the people in a sense. And then in November? Yeah, November we're gonna do the final conference of the year, which will be a bit different than our regular conferences because this is the community conference from the activation program. So this will be closing off the year. So throughout the year we have had all our smaller community meetups hearing from Berlin initiatives, how they work around the topics of our conferences and in this final community conference we bring both the conference stream topics and the community program all together and we look back at the topics of this year in connection to these Berlin-based initiatives. Mm -hmm. And so as usual we want to finish by thanking uh, our team and the great people that have been working on this conference. Uh, so I want to thank uh, Daniela Silvestrin, Nada Bakker and Monty Harmony uh, that has been the project managers of this conference, and uh, Jonas Franchi, the visual designer, and Giacomo Marin Salta, our PR manager. And now we take the occasion uh, to uh, invite uh, Daniela here on stage. I'm gonna get the Where is she? Daniela? Daniela Silvestri. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you didn't expect that because you were there doing your you know, work, but now you are put here with us. <laughs> and the reason is that uh, Daniela Thank is uh, leaving so us because uh, she is going into a new adventure that can I announce it? Is public? No? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so she will be the co-artistic director of uh, ACUD, that is a great space here uh, in Berlin in Mitte. And uh, so that is why, you know, we are really thankful and grateful to Daniela because not only she has been working again this year with us for the production, but Daniela has been really the first person that worked with me at the Disruption Network Club. So actually the grounding of this program came also to the work of Daniela. So we did together the first application and she has been working with us for all 2015 and also 2016 curating one event. So Daniela is really an important person of the Disruption Network <laughs> Club. So we want to really to thank her. <laughs> and now you say, if you can go, yes, okay. And uh, so, um, and then we finally want to uh, thank uh, also our great uh, sound technician, Elizabeth Enke, that is over there, thank you. And also Thorsten that is working with the technology support and Maria Silvano for the photos. 
Um, and so our wonderful video crew, Gonzalo, Gabriel, and Hel, and the streaming crew over there, the boiling heads that uh, do really wonderful work as well. And uh, um, then uh, Lauren for his work on our editorial support, and uh, the people working at the uh, cash desk, Jojo, and the helpers building up the space. Uh, I think I, Guillermo. I think, uh, Guillermo, yes. Uh, so I think we mentioned them all. Yeah, I yes. Think so. And uh, thank you. <laughs> And of course, thank you, Lite. But thank you, uh, Tatiana. Thank each other, <laughs> yes. And so, see you at the community program and in September. And thank you to all the great speakers that have been with us so far. Thank you.